Okay, would you introduce yourself? Tell us your name and DOC number, please. Lawrence Jacobs, 302521. And I see Mr. Jacobs, you're represented by council today. Council, please introduce yourself. Good morning, my name is Josh Schwartz. I'm here to represent Lawrence Jacobs. All right, and uh, will you wrap it up for us at the end? Yes, yes, I will uh, defer till the end. Okay, and uh, let me just acknowledge the folks who've joined us. We have the Parole Project, Mr. Myers, Shirley Poole, J.C. Johnson, Jr., Lawrence Jacobs, Sr., Annie Poole, <laughs> Betty Jacobs, Yolanda Edwards, Larry Edwards, so David Lane, Catherine Knight, uh, there at the penitentiary, we have Tiffany T, uh, Viola uh, Williams, Lisa Latham, Billy Latham, Josh Schwartz. Oh, I got you, Mr. Schwartz. I'm sorry. Loretta Kendrick, Susan Johnson, Sydney Morton, and Jessica Williams. Thanks everybody for coming today. Um, we have also here in opposition a representative from the DA's office in Jefferson, Mr. Randy Meyer, uh, representing the victim, Sandra Mensman and Ward Mensman Jr. Uh, Bernita Softly with the Capitals Appeals Project is here. Uh, and we also have a victim advocate, Ms. Ann Lelovin. Um, so uh, anybody who has indicated they'd like to speak uh, will be allowed to do so at the appropriate time. And let me let me just make a correction. I see Mr. Hunley here. He's representing the parole project this morning. We'll call on him at the appropriate time as well. First, uh, Mr. Jacobs, I'm going to read some identifying information, ask you to confirm it, and then I'll turn, turn it over to Mr. Roche. Your case has been assigned to him this morning. He'll take the lead on the interview. So, Mr. Jacobs, you're classified as a first felony offender. You're currently serving a life sentence. You were sentenced in Jefferson Parish uh, for armed robbery, April 1st, 2003. You received a 25 year sentence. And then October 6, 2020, uh, two count second degree murder, life sentence on each. And those sentences are running consecutive. Um, is that information correct, sir? Yes, ma'am. All right. You're, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Roche. For Please answer his questions. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Good morning, Mr. Jacobs. How are you? I'm good. How you doing, Mr. Roche? Good. I'm fine. Thank you for asking. Mr. Jacobs, we, uh, I'm going to present some facts, and then we'll have a conversation, okay? Yes, sir. Mr. Jacobs, you're currently 44 years old. Excuse me. You currently 44 years old? Yes, sir. And what was the age at the time you committed this offense? 16. 16. So basically, uh, you've been incarcerated for what, 27 years? Yes, sir. And your first felony offender. And you classified as a juvenile life because you committed was convicted of this crime and sentenced to life without benefit of probation and parole before the age of 18. Yes, sir. And what we're looking to, for today is a level of maturity and rehabilitation over the last 27 years. So let's get started. Tell us about the programs that you've completed in the last 27 years. I have completed 100 hours. I have completed Thinking for a Change. Um, I have completed Substance Abuse. I have completed Victim Awareness. I have completed, uh, I have got a degree in Culinary Arts. I have certification in welding. Um, I'm currently in the Bible college. Uh, we just finished our semester, so I may have one class left that I will continue to finish if this board grants me parole. 
um, to get my bachelor's and associate's degree in theology. Um, I have completed trauma healing. I have completed the Compassion Institute. I have completed... Um, it's it's a very long list. So yes, yes, sir. We get the jazz, and I I just wanted to put into the record a few of the things that you've completed. Tell us about any community service that you performed uh, in the last ten or fifteen years. Um, I have dealt with the uh, a marathon that we have annually here in Angola. I have been in the uh, the Life of Christ play. Uh, I've been at a drama club where we perform for the hospital, hospice programs. Um, I have been in um, our Islamic community. We have, we give back to the community here in Angola annually. I've been in a lot of different community affairs. Uh, uh, talk with kids coming up here, but being with the drama club, the youth, basically just advocating and giving them my story so they don't follow in my footsteps. Um, that's about it. Tell us about any organizations that you participate in on a regular basis. I mean, the Islamic community, I mean, JCs. I mean, um, I deal with toy shop. Uh, um, how, long I mean, been, how long have you been working with the toy shop? I've been working with the toy shop for the last like several years. Like not not in the as far as making the toys, the bikes, but like I work for them <laughs> as far as their concession for when visitation. We we cook the breakfast for the uh, visitors when they come up here, things like that. Okay. Any any Toastmasters? And the pause program. I've been in the pause program. Okay. And it's a wonderful program. Uh, I think you prepare the dogs for the veterans and, and disabled. Yes, sir. Okay. Any Toastmaster? No, sir. I had took JC speak up class before. Okay. Uh Tell us, what level of trustee are you? Right now, I had this Friday, I had just got recommended for a uh, trustee this last Friday. Um, so I don't know if it, the process is finished yet, but I got recommended for C-class trustee this past so, Friday. So you're not even, you're not even a C-class trustee as of now? As of now, no. Okay. Just recommend it. Uh, what, what is your current job at Louisiana State Penitentiary? I currently have uh, two jobs. I'm a senior at the Bible College, and I work at the hospital at night. Those are the two jobs that I hold. What are you doing at the hospital at night? Um, I'm an orderly, and I help out with the patients at nighttime and awards when they need okay. help. So, so, so you're you're on a night shift at the hospital. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Okay. And it, you mentioned culinary. Any other vocational skills that you've uh, obtained while incarcerated? Uh, welding. I have certification in NCER welding. Those are two uh, both texts. So let's talk about drugs and alcohol. Did drugs or alcohol play any part in this offense? No, sir. <clears throat> Have you ever used illegal drugs? Yes, sir. Uh, at what age did you start? 13. And what did you start with? Marijuana. Did you graduate to anything stronger? No, sir. Unless you consider uh, alcohol stronger. No, I'm talking about 
marijuana, heroin, men? Oh, no, no, sir. How long did you uh, use marijuana? Up until I got incarcerated. So for three years? Yes, sir. When's the last time you used marijuana? Up until I got incarcerated, like right before, right before um, I got incarcerated. 27 years you've been incarcerated. You've never received a write-up of intoxication. No, sir. But tell us exactly, tell us exactly why Lawrence Jacob is incarcerated today. What did you do? October, first of all, I just want to... Um, sir, just answer my question. Yes, sir. What did October, you do? October 31st, 1996, uh, I was a runaway living at 4012 North Dales. And I woke that morning to with the intention to go rob, with the intention to go on rob because I was trying to support myself. And I left that house and my co-defendant Roy Bridgewater came out behind me, asked me where I was going. And I told him I was going to, what I was going to do. He asked, could he come along with me? I said, yeah, you can come. So, we went over to the next neighborhood and we ran across a woman named Brenda Menard. She was outside her house. Our intentions were to rob her at first, but she kind of seen that, you know, we was up to no good. So she kept her distance and she was like, really just asking us why we wasn't in school. And um, so I, I felt that she kind of knew that we was up to no good. So I told Roy, let's go. So once we started to leave, I felt she was gonna call the police. So I was going back to my friend's house. Upon us leaving the neighborhood, we seen Nelson, Mr. Nelson Bo by his van. And me and Roy agreed to go rob him. So we went up to him and we asked him the question about where a certain street was using the street that we just came off that Brenda Menard was on. So once he turned and pointed to that street, we came up with our guns and asked him to step into the garage and then ultimately to his house. We asked him, was anybody else in the house? He said his mother was in the kitchen. So I went and got his mother and brought her in the bedroom with him. And then Roy told me to go search the house for any valuables electronics things that we can sell. So he held them at gunpoint and I went to ransack the house looking for things, valuables. So I accumulated the valuables and brought them into the bedroom. And then Roy said to, we had enough valuables to we needed to use the van. So we asked Nelson where the keys was to the van. He said he dropped them outside when we pull our guns out on him. So I went outside to search for the keys for the van and I found them. I opened up the van door and began to load up the van. So once I loaded up the van with all the valuables, I went back into the house. I told Roy I'm about to get the phones for they wouldn't call the police once we leave. Roy told me to go and start the van that they wasn't gonna call the police. So I went to go start the van, but before I made it to the van, I heard the gunshots. So I ran and jumped in the van. I started the van, then Roy came running out the house and he jumped in the van. And um, I went to back up out the, out the yard, but I was so you know nervous and shaken from what just happened. And I asked him, you know, what happened? And he told me that they seen our face. And um, I, I just couldn't drive, so we switched seats. And um, you know, at that time, right then and there, I just knew I, I just I was responsible for two people dying. And um, so he drove us to his house, and that what happened to that's how the murder happened. Um, uh, with Mr. Nelson and Miss Delabo. 
So, so you weren't even in the house when it happened? No, sir. Okay. I'm going to read you a statement that you made at the time you were arrested. This is your statement at the time you were arrested. And you were arrested on November 3rd. Uh, November 3rd of that year, right? A couple of days after. Yes, sir. Lawrence Jacobs Jr. arrived at the detective bureau with his father. Jacobs admit being with Roy Bridgewater on the date of the homicides. He advised the intention was to go in and rob the victims. During the robbery, Bridgewater shot the victims because his face had been seen too much. The stolen property and weapons were found at Bridgewater's house. Later on the same date, Bridgewater asked to speak to the officer. He admitted being with Jacobs on the morning of the murders. And then he said they were in fact with the female early. He admitted being seen Nelson Bird near the garage of his home, but Jacobs went in to rob the man himself. Bridgewater claimed he left the scene. Jacobs when talking to Jacobs later, Jacobs later showed up at Bridgewater's house in the raid van. When questioning Jacobs again, he admitted to robbing the victims of the van, and later he admitted shooting them. Bridgewater stated he got into the van and drove across the bridge to New Orleans and disposed of the van. This report says that you admitted robbing the victims. This, the report I'm reading is the actual police report where you admitted to the police in, in 1996 that you actually shot the victims. No, sir. Okay, so this report I have is wrong. My lawyer, my lawyer will clarify uh, the F that was okay. uh, my statement. Yeah. Okay. Go, go ahead, sir. The the full statement by Mr. Jacobs. I don't know if that's a transcription mistake, switching the names, but the full statement from Mr. Jacobs in the police file. He only gave one statement to the police. Mr. Bridgewater gave four or five different statements. The full statement um, is entirely consistent with what he just told the board. Um, at which point the statement ends, and there was not another. Uh, statement. I don't know if that's a switching of the names, but the, the full statement in the file, which I have, and I, I know Miss Softly and Baton Rouge has, um, that was the full and only statement that Mr. Jacobs gave, and it was entirely consistent with what he told the board. Okay. Thank you, sir. So, uh, Mr. Jacobs, Let's talk about your disciplinary conduct. How is your disciplinary conduct? Uh, I haven't had a write-up in two years. My last write-up was 
uh, Alter Tablet in November. Um, it was the, it, it, 20, it was the JPA system, right? Yes, sir. So fraudulent activity on a JPA? Yes, sir. Which is a very serious offense. Yes, sir. We also had 17 or 18 other write-ups in the last 10 years. Very serious infections, including aggravated sex offenses, contraband, and there were three or four write-ups involving with the JPEG fraud activity. You had unauthorized apps, and then you were selling your hobbyware online, which is a serious infection of BOC rules. Yes, sir. I don't see the maturity of that. You have been incarcerated 25 years, and you were still committing infractions, serious infractions, while you were incarcerated. I would look for at least three to five years of right up free. You've had 17 or 18 write-ups in the last 10 years. That doesn't show me the maturity and rehabilitation that I'm looking for. Now, I, I can go over your disciplinary record and you can give me some explanations on why such immature activity. In, in November 2021, you had an 18, a 30B, a 30X, and a 30G. And all of this dealt with your JPEG. IPAD, is that correct? Yes, sir. And you received 10 days disciplinary and you were sent to lockdown, which is an indication it was yes, a- Yes, sir, I played guilty. Yeah, it was a very serious offense. And the same month, November 21st, you had a contraband. What was the contraband? That was the same. That was just the same write up for two different. It was two different writers for the same offense. Okay, but it was on two different days. No, it it was yeah two different days. Um, because once they found the tablet in the hobby shop, um, I didn't get locked up. It was supposed to have been a walk in, but they mm -hmm. came back um a few days later and wrote the same write-up as contraband to have me locked up. And they, and when I went through court, they're supposed to have uh, threw the contraband out and found me, uh, I pled guilty to the tablet. Um, I had altered, I had, had it made, I had it altered during the time of the pandemic. And you're right, you're absolutely right. That was a, a immature um, move on my part. Um, you know, regardless whether I just wanted to communicate uh, with the, with my family and friends during that time of the pandemic where everything was shut down, but there's no excuse. You're right. It was immature on my part. And I, that's why I pled guilty and owned up to it, accountability. And I just worked my way back into the good graces um, of my community and security because I knew I had messed up, you know, it was a long, I had to work my way back as okay. far as getting back to school and everything and working. So you're right. Okay, Mr. Jacob, how about March 2021? Defiance, aggravated disobedience, and inappropriate behavior. It's another offense where I went, I shouldn't even, shouldn't even happen. I took full responsibility for, uh, I went back and forth with an officer 
about going to the hobby shop. Um, and you know, I, it's just something that I shouldn't have done. Mr. Jacobs, Mr. Jacobs, you've been incarcerated 25 years at that point, and you should have known better. You're right. You're definitely right, sir. You're definitely right. You know, I'm not I'm not perfect, and you're absolutely right. But it's far from perfect. You're right. October 20th, a 30W. What was the 30W about? The 30W, um, that, that was dealing with a, a confidential informer said they heard me make a remark about an officer. And they felt like that I was going to assault her. And so security had me locked up based upon the assumption of whoever the confidential informants was. And in 2018, you had a defiance and two aggravated disobedience. Hmm. 2017, aggravated work offense. 2016, defiance. 2015 aggravated sex offense. It's 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 a custom thing, and as I said before, Mr. Jacobs, I've been hearing juvenile life's case since 2016, and I usually see those juvenile lifers. I see a clear disciplinary write-up record, at least three to five, often 10 years. I see most of the write-ups in the lab in the first 10 years of their incarceration. When I see him at year 20, 22, 23, 24, I don't see any write-ups. I don't see that in your case. And it is concerning to me when I'm supposed to look for a level of maturity when a 40-year-old man is still committing very serious infections that get him in lockdown. Madam Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Rochelle. Um, I don't see any other questions, so we'd like to hear the folks who want to speak in favor. And first, we'll hear from Mr. Hunt. Uh, Andrew Hundley with Louisiana Parole Project appearing today to confirm to the board uh, that uh, if Lawrence is granted parole, he has been accepted into uh, our reentry program. We've been working with Lawrence uh, for the last couple of years to prepare for his potential reentry. Uh, if he's granted parole, he will immediately come to our residential reentry program in Baton Rouge. Uh, where he will uh, immediately uh, undergo a substance abuse and mental health evaluation by a staff social worker, and he'll be expected to comply with all recommendations given uh, by that staff social worker. He will also be assigned a peer mentor case manager, uh, and during his first several weeks, uh, he will go through life skills training, such as techn technological skills, uh, financial management skills, communication skills, uh, <clears throat> job seeking skills, uh, and, and an array of other programming designed to assist people who've been incarcerated for a long period of time with their reentry. Uh, as the sport is aware, our organization has done reentry for most of the juvenile lifers who've been released in Louisiana over the last several years, uh, and. Uh, we have a excellent success rate uh, with juvenile lifers uh, who have been given a second chance uh, based on Lawrence's uh, programming record and, and uh, accomplishments since he's been incarcerated is our organization's opinion uh, that if he's given uh, a second chance, he would have no problem uh, completing the requirements of our program. And I stand by to answer any other questions you may have about his reentry. Thank you. All right, thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Lawrence Jacobs, Sr. Good morning. 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 
My name is Lawrence Jacob Sr. I'm Lawrence Jacob Ed, and I'm here with my wife, Ms. Daddy Jacob, family and friends. And we are here to support his parole. And we're pretty excited about it, but myself, I uh, kind of have mixed emotions because I know that once again, the both family have to live through their tragedy once again. And I know that my family and Lawrence, especially Lawrence, we uh, truly, truly sorry about his involvement. And uh, as you heard, he's taken ownership. He does not want me to set up here and try to make excuses for him because he's taken total ownership for it. But I've seen him grow. I've seen him develop and I've seen him mature. You know, while uh, his time in, um, in prison. And he could have went the wrong way, different way, but I really think that it actually strengthened uh, his resolve. Uh, I know, and I've just heard, you know, some of the different write ups that um, are really well the world, but I do know that uh, he's really been staying very, very positive. I've seen a lot of positive actions from him. Uh, I've seen them, how he uh, takes on his religion. I embrace it. I've seen him learn uh, new trades and uh, new skills. You know, we heard about all the different programs that he went through. You know, about to name them, but he's already done that uh, for us. And um, I've seen him really grow and uh, be, uh, you know, a, a really, really very positive. And uh, I'm on the program. Uh, he still stayed positive. He still thought about the future because he never knew that this particular day would come. And uh, I can remember the time going to some of the uh, rodeos where Angola allowed him to set up his, his plays of jury. And he does a very nice job making the handmade jury. Actually, I'm wearing a piece right here today. And, uh, you know, I'm standing next to him and I'm feeling like a very, very proud dad watching him communicate. And his reaction with the general public, I think he said now, you know, it's staying job with the general public. And uh, it was amazing. I was able to his play, uh, his jury, talk to the customer, telling them what was good on him, and also taking future orders for, from the customer to even have the items that they wanted. So I'm here and I'm asking the board, leading with you guys, and begging you guys, to give them an opportunity. To enroll into uh, the re entry program right here in Baton Rouge, where he can go out uh, in the public and find a job, find a career, uh, or even start his own business, where he can become financially stable. I'm also asking, this really was one of my requests, is that he go back into the community and he give back, uh, help the young kids, you know, being a mentor. Young kids that lost their way. Um, be able to tell the story and help them get on the right track. I'm also asking the board will to give them opportunity to go out and be able to attend church of his choice where he can serve and praise God. Um, I'm asking you guys because I know that if you release. He would really, really have something to raise God. I prayed to God for that day. And I'm praying also that that day goes today. Okay. Uh, so I'm asking just please give him opportunity to be the man that we raised him to be. Uh, he has the skills, he has a chip, he go along with the skills. He also has a drive, he has the ambition. And to me, he had no other choice. Uh, he can you wrap it up for us, sir, Mr. Jacobs? Okay, he had me and his mom uh, to support him. He had his grandmother was there with him, uh, that had been with him ever since from day one. He's uh, he's 88 years old. And so I just asked the board to give him uh, an opportunity. Uh, his family is there to support him, whether it's moral, whether it's uh, financial. And if you give him an opportunity, I'm sure he'll make us all proud. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. And then uh, from Angola, Ms. Tiffany T. Um, yes, good morning. Do I need to thank you? You're good. Okay, thank good you. 
Good morning. Um, my name is Tiffany Teague, and I'm Lawrence's um, fiance. I first would like to start by um, just making it quick, um, giving honor to God first, um, because this is the day that he has made, and we're going to rejoice um, in this day and be glad. I definitely would like to thank the honorable board for giving Lawrence this opportunity. Um, like his dad stated, this was something that we didn't know of. We knew that he was eligible for parole at one point, but when it was going to be, we did not know. And I definitely will not move forward without giving um, our deepest condolences to the Bowles family and the loss of their loved one, Miss um, Della Bowles and Mr. Nelson Bowles. And just quickly, um, what can came to mind is 1 Corinthians 13, um, round about um, verse 11, 10 or 11. And it says that when I was a child, I spoke as a child, I acted as a child, and I thought as a child. But when I grew older, I threw away all the um, childish ways. And that says a lot about Lawrence. As we all know, he was 16 years old when this tragedy took place. It doesn't overshadow that two lives were lost but it does show the level of maturity. And 27 years later, um, he has become an amazing, um, strong individual, positive, patient, and trustworthy. And lastly, I just want you all to know that I'm in support with his family. I stand fully behind him financially, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. And one other thing about Lawrence is that when you come in contact with him and you meet him, He's a very positive person. He's always pushing you to be your best, to exceed that the sky is the limit. And that's the type of person that our community needs. And out of the many and numerous thousands of conversations that we had, I remember one conversation that we have. I have always um, stuck with and went by. And Lawrence told me, he said, what you have to remember in life and if you don't remember anything else in life, you do have to know the do's and the don'ts of life. And that let me know that in his journey, that was the process that he had to go through in order to be the person that he is today. So lastly, I ask that you all would please consider um, granting parole. Um, some people say a second chance. I like to say a chance because, again, he was 16 years old. And I really feel that he deserves the opportunity as a 44-year-old man to take his story, tell it, touch one, teach one, and be able to help someone else. And thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, Warren Falger, is there anything you'd like to add? I, I don't have anything to add, Mr. Nonsley. Okay, thank you. Um, so we'll hear now from uh, opposition. If we could hear first from Ms. Sandra. Sandra Mensman. Thank you. Hi, my name is Sandra Mensman. I was um, Nelson Bowe's sister, and Della Bowe was my mother. Um, I have. I am very strongly opposed to you getting out. I think that um, your parents said at the time you ran with the wrong crowd. Yeah, but Ms. you Ms. had a excuse me, ma'am. I'm sorry yeah, to direct okay. your, your remarks to us, not to the uh oh okay. Okay. Thank you. Um I'm strongly opposed to him being released. Um I think that he hasn't served the whole time. I was under the impression that he was supposed to serve like two consecutive years, two twenty-five years for one murder and 25 years for the other one. So I don't think he served the whole time. And um, I've heard what he's he's done. Um, I just, I, I don't think that he should be released right now. I think he should stay in prison and not, and do, and do something, something better for his, for his life. Yes, ma'am. Um, Thank you very much. And uh, is is that Mr. Ward with you? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, and, I, and I know they keep saying he was only 16, but if you check the records, he was only a few days off of, of, of being 17. 
when I was 17 years old, I was graduating from high school. I had a choice of being bad or good. I chose good. And he had the same choice. He chose to, to go and rob people. And this wasn't his first stuff. He was he had a he had a pretty good record before he even got before he even graduated to murder. So then when the judge uh when when the judge came up with the, the sentence, he said that there was gonna he would have to serve his, his sentence for the other crimes that he had done before and then start two life sentences, one behind the other. Not not grouping them all together like AT&T. He should have to serve two life sentences, not just one. He did. He, they murdered people that won't come back. Well, I got Yes, sir. And thank you. Thank you both. We'll hear from the DA's office now, Mr. Meyer. Good morning, Randy Meyer, Assistant DA in Jefferson Parish. Um, you know, I think looking at this record and listening to the, the, the questions that Mr. Roche went through, particularly with regard to his disciplinary record, I think it clearly shows that he hasn't reached the level of maturity that uh, is mandated for him to be released. Um, and if we, if we first off listen to what Mr. Jacobs stated when, about the offense, he was going out to rob people. He got his gun and he was leaving to go rob people when Bridgewater came to him and said, what you doing? Uh, can I come? Yeah, come on with me. So, it, it, you know, we, we can't throw everything on Mr. Bridgewater. Mr. Jacobs was doing what he was doing, which was committing violent offenses. Um, the, as you heard, there's very strong victim opposition. Um, and But his, his disciplinary record is very, very concerning. Um, you know, it shows he had a significant number of offenses. He had three sex offenses after he was over 30 years old. Um, page 70, I believe it is, in the, uh, in the record that I have, shows um, he had two Schedule B violations in 2022, which that's not showing up on the conduct report. I don't know if, if that's an error or, or what that is, but it shows additional, you know, he's continuing to get disciplinary records. I mean, disciplinary reports. He's had disciplinary reports for pretty much every year um, of his incarceration up until either 2021 or 2022, um, you know, depending on whether those are accurate or not. And, you know, I would note, too, that a prior hearing was continued because of disciplinary reports. Most of the certificates that he has, uh, the vast majority have been before 2017. Um, I, I think he could continue to, to do more with regard of, of programming and uh, to help him. You know, maybe additional anger management would be appropriate. Um, something to, to stop to make him learn he's got to follow the rules and not continue with, with these horrible disciplinary reports that he's been obtaining. So those reasons were opposed to his request for parole. Thank you, Mr. Meyer. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Jacobs, before we turn it over to Mr. Schwartz, is there a statement you'd like to make? Yes, ma'am. May I speak? Yes. First and foremost, I want to apologize to the entire Bo family for one, having to relive these moments after having to say these details of the crime. Um, I want to apologize for my actions and I take full responsibility. Um, I want to apologize to Stephanie Bo and Brandon Bo for being responsible for why their father and their grandmother is no longer here. Um, I apologize because I know because of my actions both of y'all lost the father and daughter moments and father and son moments. And, you know, just not able to get those wise words from your grandmother. I'm sorry, I apologize. Um, I like to apologize 
to Annette Boat because of my actions, you no longer have your husband or your mother-in-law. You know, you had to be the glue of your family. You had to be mother and a father. You know, Miss Sandra, I apologize to you because of my actions you lost. Your brother and your mother, you know, those. Those precious times you could have with your mother, or those moments with your brother. It doesn't matter whether or not, if I ain't pulled the trigger or not, I'm still responsible. Just because I woke up with them ill intents to go harm somebody or rob somebody, if I would have never did that, your family would still be here. I want to apologize to my family for them having to just see that I just hadn't been associated and committing these crimes like this and bringing shame to our family name. I apologize to the citizens of Louisiana just for having to waste taxpayers' money for doing such, such a senseless act. And if this board sees it fit to grant me a second chance, it would not go wasted. <clears throat> you know, you're right, Mr. Rochelle. I definitely, you know, had some write-ups um, at the latter years. And the old me, I was self-destructed, but I, the mature me, utilized those programs that I've learned throughout the course of my incarceration to, to not go backwards, just to keep moving forward and try to continue to do something positive. You know, even after that last write-up, I still got back refreshing courses of thinking for a change, you know, to... Uh, uh, going through victim awareness, through the trauma healing, um, just trying to continue doing positive things if I don't continue to go wrong, do wrong. You know, I'm not perfect. I, you're right, I'm far from it, but I try. I try to do right. I try to be positive. I try to work hand in hand with security here. I've been in programming. I done, I done created programs. Um, I don't work with children here and you have to be in a certain standard to even do those things, you know, and the latter part, I, I, I'm not a trustee now, but I was between 2013 to 2017 B class trustee before that last write up of this hearing, uh, the last hearing I was supposed to go off, you know, and I just got recommended again. So I, I work hard and I try hard. And Mr. Roche, I guarantee you, if you give me a second chance, you would not go wasted. I would continue to do the same things out there in society that I'm doing in here, working with at-risk youth, creating programs to work hand-in-hand -hand with law, law enforcement, with my creative ways, the creative program and methods that I would like to use Um to bring the community, law enforcement, and the district attorney office together to try to help curb the youth because I know what they're going through. I've been there. And that's the things that Jacobs, I want to get the rest of my us, life. Sir. Mr. Jacobs, can you wrap it up for us? Yes, sir? ma'am. So I just appreciate y'all giving me this time and opportunity. And thank you. Thank you. Mr. Schwartz. Thank you. Mr. Roche, I know you brought up uh, disciplinary write-ups, and I'd like to start by addressing that. Um, you know, I understand uh, the board's concerns. I'll note that after his latest write-up in 2021, what Lawrence did is go back to the prison programming that he has so frequently availed himself of. 
He retook thinking for a change. He took a trauma healing class. He got back into the Bible college. He's working nights at the hospital. Um, he went back and devoted himself to the programming to get himself on the right track. And, and I hope that that would give the board confidence. Uh, I'll also note that while it's certainly no excuse for the write-ups, he had uh, a two and a half year period before those write-ups uh, where he was also write-up free. Um, and 90% and of his write-ups are over a decade old. He's not perfect, and he's the first one to say that. I think what sets Lawrence apart and what makes this, uh, what makes him exceptional is his devotion to the incredible programming that is offered at the Louisiana State Penitentiary. I mean, he has done over 50 programs during his time. And I know the board hears lots of statements of remorse. Um, what I'd encourage the board to think about in determining uh, whether Mr. Jacobs is authentic is look at what he was doing when no one was watching. He was still young, he was still maturing, he was still developing, but in 2008, he came off of pretrial lockdown and had access to programming for the very first time. He got his GED, his culinary arts degree, his welding certification, and did about 20 programs in the matter of two years. This is years before Miller and Montgomery. It's when he had a life without parole sentence, no hope of eventual release. And that's what he did years before anyone would be watching and years before Miller and Montgomery would change the law. You know, DOC has considered him a low risk of recidivism for five years. You also have the extensive report from Dr. Kinsher, who is an expert in this field, uh, like the board, uh, who is also an expert in this field, concurring with DOC's uh, recommendations um, and assessment. You know, he was one of the few participants in the Life of Christ program. I know you talked about the PAUSE program. I, I spoke to Dr. Sharkey personally, and uh, Mr. Jacobs would just have a few credits he could complete online were, were he to be released. I think what truly sets him apart is his devotion to the programming, and it's an example of the incredible power of the programming being offered here at LSP. I will just briefly comment on reentry. I know the board is very familiar with parole project, and I'll note that Mr. Jacobs would be set to do their uh, rigorous employment enhancement program. In addition, he would be residing with Ms. Teague in Baton Rouge. Um, Ms. Teague has two decades of experience in the medical field. Um, he has an incredible family support. This is the family of, you know, professionals, realtors, teachers, uh, federal investigators, um, medical professionals, and he knows he's lucky to have that support. And, and he also knows that it doesn't mean anything if he doesn't do right out there, which is why he wants to continue with substance abuse uh, programming um, and anger management upon uh, completion of parole project if given that opportunity. And I'll close by saying this. You know, I, I was Lawrence's lawyer um, in 2019. That's how I was very familiar with the record. And I knew about, um, to, was able to clarify the, the issue with the statement earlier. Um, and I was his lawyer during COVID and he got COVID really early on when we still didn't know what was going on with it and how dangerous it was. It was a scary time. He was at Camp J with inmates from all around the state. And I could hear his shortness of breath. I talked to him almost every day. Um, and I could also hear him put down the phone literally every two minutes to help someone. He volunteered to be a tear orderly during that time. No one asked him to do that. He was cleaning and scrubbing down Camp J and helping security staff to sanitize. He was helping guide all of these pretrial detainees from around the state who had been sent to Angola. Um, and I think that says a lot about who he is and why this board um, can have confidence that if released out onto supervision um, through the parole pro project program, he will ultimately be successful. So we ask that you grant his parole and he will abide by any and all restrictions that this board sees fit. We thank you for your time. Thank you. We appreciate it. All right. Um, this concludes this proceeding. And are we prepared to vote? <laughs> yeah. I vote for executive session. We have a motion for a session. Second. In a second. Could you do the roll call, please? Sure, on that so? Yes. Alvin Wilshire? Yes. Yes. So we'll um, 
be in executive session for a few moments, Mr. Jacobs, to discuss confidential matters. We'll return shortly. Okay, we are back in regular session. It's 10, 10 a.m. and we are prepared to vote. Mr. Roche will be voting first. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Mr. Jacobs, the Supreme Court and all the lower district courts has set some guidelines that we are uh, have to follow. And like I said before, the first juvenile life case I heard was in 2016. And it's mandated that I look for a level of maturity and rehabilitation. All the psychiatrists and all the training that I've had over the last eight years says that especially a male child does not mature until the ages of between 28 and 30 years old. It takes us a little longer to mature than our counterpart. But you have received multiple write-ups between the ages of 35 and 42. At which point I would expect you to mature to the point where you've been incarcerated for over 15, 20 years in your new rooms and you chose deliberately to violate those rules. The last write-up was a write-up of deception. You never thought you were going to get caught. You thought you manipulated an iPad to the point where you could use it for your personal benefit. It shows a lack of rehabilitation and a lack of maturity on your part. You have done very well while you're incarcerated. You've completed a tremendous amount of programs. You've earned the rank of earning a BA degree in your last semester. But you still hadn't reached the point of maturity where I feel comfortable releasing you. So based on a lack of rehabilitation, based on a lack of maturity, the victim's family is adamantly opposed, law enforcement is opposed, and the Jefferson Parish DA's office is strongly opposed. I'm denying your request for early release. Before I finish, Madam Chairman, I would like to thank the victims for their participation in this hearing. And I want to impress on Mr. Jacobs, you have a loving family who supports you. It is about time that you realize that you have to do exactly as you should. It's there right up for at least three to five years, and you've got to start on that. Three to five years, when you're eligible again, reapply. But you must, must follow the rules and regulations and try and stop trying to manipulate, to manipulate the system as you did in 2021. Madam Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Richley. Mrs. Jackson. All right, um, Mr. Jacobs, uh, I would like to commend you for the positive things that you've done. You have accomplished a lot and you should be uh, very proud of those accomplishments. 
However, I'm also concerned about your disciplinary conduct. I would have thought that this far into your incarceration and at the age that you were when these infractions occurred would not have happened had you, you know, been more mature, that's the right word, but it concerns me that your write-up the disciplinary history uh, over the last three years has not been very good. I also believe that there's been insufficient time, sir, uh, on this crime, given the fact that two people lost their lives. And even though you might not have been the actual shooter, uh, you certainly put everything in motion and you acknowledge that. And I do appreciate that. I truly appreciate that you owned your responsibility uh, in this case. And I appreciate that you have uh, shown a recognition of the harm that you caused to the victims in this case. And I believe that your expressions are sincere. But for me, uh, today is not the day. I think your day will come. I encourage you to keep working hard and not get any other write-ups. But my vote today would be to do not. Mrs. Jackson. Uh, and I do concur with my colleagues. It's concerning the disciplinary infractions and the nature of those infractions. So my vote today also is to do not. A strong encouragement, though. Don't be discouraged. Reapply safe. And continue doing what you're doing. Reapply when you're eligible to do so. Good luck to you, sir. 